Our guest today is the Chief Executive Officer of 1871. 1871 is the tech incubator of roughly 250 small companies in Chicago's co-working space for online startups. He has been described, actually in the Chicago Tribune, as, quote, something of a godfather of Chicago's tech scene, unquote, and, quote, the public face of Chicago's tech community. Our guest today earned his undergraduate and law degree from Northwestern University, and the smartest decision he ever made was marrying his wife, who is with us today, Judy. Let's give her a round of applause, and let's welcome Howard Tolman. Howard. Thank you. So uh, Skinny did me the favor of advancing my speech. Uh, that's all right, that's all right. So first I want to thank uh, the City Club and Jay in particular for the uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, with respect to 1871, we wouldn't be here in 1871 without the vision of uh, J.B. Pritzker, so I want to be sure to call him out. Uh, the governor, uh, tremendously supportive, our mayor as well, and as I like to say, the governor stepped up for the cash and Rom stepped up for the credit. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, what can I say? He's our mayor. I love him. You know. uh, quit, quit right there. That was a good line. All right. And I want to thank, uh, uh, I want to thank the Mart as well. Uh, the Mart has been a place where I've been for I think about 53 years, uh, my dad had a showroom there, uh, literally, about uh, when I was 12 or something like that. Uh, I feel like it's been a family home for us forever. We had uh, CCC there, uh, Tribeca Flashpoint, 1871, of course, all scripts. Uh, and it's amazing to see the transformation of the Mart to become a tech center for the whole city in so many exciting ways. And that's just the beginning because uh, there's great things coming. Uh, the Mart's going to continue to morph and expand, uh, and we're excited to be a part of that, and they've been an unbelievable partner. So uh, with respect to that, let me get started uh, and talk to you about uh, where we've been. Uh, just briefly, 2013 was an amazing year, and these are courtesy of Built in Chicago, which is a terrific resource and which has been a... Uh, a uh, way of really crystallizing this idea of startups and uh, technology and entrepreneurship in the city. Uh, great year, a tremendous amount of funding, tremendous amount of new launches, also exits. Uh, and it's, uh, it was sort of a banner year, except for essentially Groupon. Uh, this was uh, a billion plus in terms of new funding, so exciting. Uh, the exits were over $3 billion, uh, and again, you know, uh, Jay said small companies, but as you'll see in a moment, uh, growth in this country doesn't come from small companies. It comes from new companies. It comes from startups. That's where the net new growth is, uh, is occurring. So as I said, this is uh, our second anniversary, uh, actually tomorrow, and uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, and, you know, we're just going to continue uh, to grow and to expand. Give you some idea of what's going on right at the moment. About 240 companies, about 400 events a year, and uh, I want to thank the 1871 team, which is here, who makes those things happen, which is completely amazing, and also the members of our board, without which we wouldn't uh, be able to do any of this. About 250 workshops, and about 4,500 4, hours of mentoring, uh, where people come and give their time to these startups to help them uh, as resources, as mentors, as examples. So uh, tremendous sort of uh, give back in terms of uh, what's going on at 1871. In terms of success, the way we measure success, at least initially, uh, about 32 graduates so far. They raised more than $33 million. But raising money is only sort of part of the story. It's really have you built a real business and a sustainable business. And so about 340 new jobs and about $12 million in annual run rate. So 
Uh, they're real, they're out there, they're continuing to grow, and uh, we're very excited about that. And as you can see, sort of the startup universe is continuing to expand as well. Uh, 2013 was a record year. We're on target to uh, even exceed that this year, and, uh, and I'm very excited about that. I mentioned this idea, so one of the things that's very interesting, we just took a group of our member companies to Washington to meet with uh, a whole bunch of different folks at the White House, and one of the sets of stats that they shared with us was that the startups really drive uh, job creation. And so as we've come out of the uh, dark days of the last recession, the principal driver of new job growth has been startups, and so that's what we're so proud of and that's what we're continuing to sort of build as we go forward. And speaking about going forward, so we call this uh, 1871 2.0. Uh, we're first, we're the largest in the United States, but we need to sort of keep it up. It's an arms race, there's constantly the nature of the startup business is fast followers and clones and iteration. So uh, we have to keep sort of raising the bar uh, there's no finish line. One of the interesting quotes of uh, Mark Zuckerberg is that uh, nothing is the future forever. That's really what we believe, so we have to keep uh, moving forward. And as I mentioned before, it's really not about funds raised. It's really uh, not about donuts, as much as I like donuts, or demo days. It's about real jobs, real revenues, and uh, real job creation, and not being on this sort of treadmill of uh, repetitive fundraising, but getting some traction and building uh, a real business that you can be proud of. And that's the other thing that I think is important. We just added a question to our intake questionnaire, and it was about not making a living, but making a life, making a difference. And that's what we want to do, and that's what we want to encourage uh, these companies. And we took that from a group within 1871, uh, Impact Engine, which is one of our accelerators, and they're for-profit businesses, but they're focused on doing good and on social change and things like that. And we decided that that was actually a pretty good component of what we want all the companies to be focused on, because ultimately, it's great to be making money, it's great to have you know fancy cars and all these things, but mostly it's about making a difference and being enthusiastic every day uh, at what you do, because this is actually a little too hard to, uh, to live with if you're not uh, comfortable and if you're not enthusiastic about what you're doing. Um, we're also changing the ground rules a little bit. It's not enough to be there. You know, I, I love uh, student unions and I love sort of the YMCA and the JCC and all these great places, but uh, and we've succeeded because goal number one really was to build a place for the community to convene, the tech community to convene, and to build a place where the community could feed off each other, support each other. It's very lonesome to be an entrepreneur. It's very noisy to be in your basement. And so the idea that, that we gave and created a place where this process could begin has been a tremendous accomplishment and set of accomplishments over the last two years. Today, we're focused on something a little different, which is progress, real progress. And so uh, this idea of measurement is increasingly gonna be a part of uh, what we're doing. Uh, we want real metrics, we want real repeatable uh, business success, and we want to turn out businesses that not only start and raise and create jobs, but are sustainable and are gonna contribute to the Chicago economy, which is robust. Uh, and which is really spectacular compared to most of the major cities in this country, but we think we can always do better. Um, also, as I mentioned, this is uh, an interesting sort of cultural issue as well, and the thought of folks just hanging out is not gonna be a successful model. So as much as we uh, want it to be a place that's welcoming, uh, as I said, it's not really a community center, uh, it's really a competitive environment. It's really a place where we want it to be a credential. We want it to be a place a little bit like the Marines, a little bit like places that you were not only proud to be at, but proud to be from. And so uh, we think of this as building you know, tomorrow's cyber CEOs and building uh, these bionic business builders who are just gonna go out and walk through walls and make change happen. And change is not easy. 
uh, but we think that we're building that culture for the city, and we think that that's one of the exciting things that uh, is gonna go on. Um, and this will be very offensive to my assistant, Jasmine, but it's actually not about scooters. <clears throat> it's not about snacks. It's not about soda pop. Um, we want to provide a platform for success, and we have a number of things that we're sort of adding to the equation to make that possible, and that's, uh, that's also significant. So just to give you some idea, we're about finally, about 18 months into this process, to have the SEC finally make it possible to raise money and to sell equity for startup businesses. Uh, to date, crowdfunding has been very popular, but mostly it's been about t-shirts and products and tchotchkes and things like that. Uh, going forward, you'll be able to raise equity. The leader in the United States is a company called Indiegogo. We're going to open a facility at 1871 in partnership with Indiegogo to train our companies to be successful at this new technology and this new process because of how important it's going to be for young businesses to uh, raise new money. Uh, we've met with Second City, and it's sort of interesting because telling your story turns out to be not as easy and as simple as you would think. And so the teams from Second City are going to come in and help our member companies uh, learn how to tell their story most effectively and how to create video presentations and things like that. Uh, programmers are engineers, and guess what? They're not artists, and basically their design sense sucks, okay? So the School of the Art Institute is going to come in, and they're going to build us a little creative ad agency populated by their students. Their students are desperate to work with digital everythings, and our, our guys desperately need some help making this stuff not look like programmer art or worse. Um, we actually also think, and we're working with Georgia Tech and also with IIT on the idea that you can actually engineer and improve this process, that you can be more successful building businesses if you take advantage of all the lessons and all the pain and all the mistakes that a huge number of people have made, and you put that into a process. And we call that basically startup engineering, and that's one of the... Uh, very exciting things that we'll be adding as a set of resources and tools, again, for our members. You know, we're constantly trying to set ourselves apart from what's going on elsewhere. It's really easy to open a space and rent some desks. It's really hard to build a culture that's competitive globally and that can be <clears throat> significant in terms of the next decade and not simply the next 10 months. And then lastly, we've announced already uh, a reciprocity agreement with London, which is really exciting in the financial uh, technology area. Uh, we'll announce momentarily, <clears throat> excuse me, that all our members will have access to the Google incubators, and uh, there's about eight now uh, across the United States, so they'll be able to go to any of those cities and land in a place where they're welcome and have uh, reciprocal rights. So, you know, we have to think uh, globally. And so we're doing international programs. We'll have groups from Turkey, from Tel Aviv. We'll have groups from London in the course of this year coming over here. The idea is this. The idea is to try to explain to them that the principal driver is not money anymore. Money is a wash. Everybody has plenty of money for new businesses. The driver is we're competing for attention, and we're competing basically for customers. And nobody has more customers than Chicago. There are no customers in the Valley. It's awful to live in New York because among other things, you don't really live in New York. You live in some you know, forgotten part of Brooklyn. And so the idea of the quality of life in Chicago and the customers and the diverse economy, as our mayor says, where no one industry contributes more than a pretty modest 13% or something like that, means that we have substantial, substantial opportunities for these new businesses, and every one of those industries is undergoing radical change. So all of that is a part of trying to make this a special place, and the place where you launch your international business and also where you build your business uh, on an ongoing basis. So I invite all of you to join uh, this grand adventure. But of course, I wouldn't be me if I wasn't somewhat rude, so I don't want you to do it for the wrong reasons. So we're not looking for good support. 
in the sense of good sports or good Samaritans. That's great, and, and I appreciate that. But we have a slightly different agenda going forward. It's okay to be charitable, but it's not enough. It's okay to be community-minded, but it's not enough. And it's okay to say, boy, we better check off the box on our corporate set of uh, mission statements that says we gotta be good to startups or entrepreneurs or whatever. We want you to do it because you're smart and because you're selfish and because you're competitive, because you really have no other choice. I call this enlightened self-interest, okay? Because we want to be your real partner, not an occasional thing. We don't, you know, we love, and we'll talk about our momentum dinner, and we love chicken as much as we had pork today. But the, uh, the truth is, the real focus is this is where change is happening. This is where your companies need to be and to be a part of. And so we want that to be the driver and that to be uh, the basis for your connection to 1871. It is where the change is happening. It's where the future is being invented every single day. It's really where you need to be and not because it's a nice thing to do, but because it's something you absolutely need to do if you want your business to remain competitive and moving forward. If you don't care about change, that's okay. It's optional, so is survival. Anyway, so how do we get there? Well, first, the thing we know for sure is that standing still is not a good strategy. Um, and so we're constantly trying to figure out how do we expand what we're doing and how do we make it even more important both to the city and to all the member companies that we're working with. So up here is uh, one of our things. Nature abhors a vacuum. It turns out that after we announced uh, Matter not so long ago, which is an exciting new facility in the Mart focused on health IT, that there was this sort of no man's land between 1871 on the 12th floor and Matter. And we figured, you know, how long should that exist? So we have a grand plan. It's not official, the mayor did us the favor of announcing it, but it's not, it's not official yet. And we need the support of the state, which we're very encouraged and excited about. We need the support of the MART. We need tenants and partners and sponsors, uh, but we have a good plan. And there are three focuses, each of which is part of this idea of expanding uh, the agenda. The first is incubators. Uh, as much and as interesting as it has been to build mobile companies and companies focused on apps, uh, what we want to do now is also uh, vertically expand and to build incubators that will permit us to move into a whole bunch of new areas, ed tech, fintech, uh, femtech, uh, internet of things, all of those things, and I'll explain why in a moment. We also uh, have discovered that when we launch our companies, those 32 companies that were great successes, when they left, it turned out that they were lonesome and that they wanted to come back. And so uh, we've decided that it's very important to keep them near and dear. They're great role models, they're great mentors, they're great folks who can help us uh, actually as employers. So one of the other things that we want to do is uh, build facilities so as our graduates leave 1871, they actually just walk down the hall <clears throat> and occupy some of these alumni spaces. And so that's gonna keep them engaged with the community and that will also do another really important thing. Uh, John Medved, who was uh, at 1871 yesterday and who's raised about $200 million in crowdfunding for startups, uh, mentioned this idea that there's a crunch, uh, the Series A crunch he described it as, which means that new companies make some progress, but when they go to raise their next financing, uh, it turns out that the people say, I'm happy to give you money, but I don't think you've moved the needle on valuation. I don't think that um, I should pay more for my ownership than the people that invested before, and that's really bad news for the people who invested before. In fact, he said, uh, that flat is the new up, which is his way of justifying uh, the fact that he just as soon not pay more either. But, uh, but the idea is the longer they stay with us, the more they grow, the more they're focused on growth in their business and not on uh, wallpaper and furniture and security deposits and things like that, the more likely they are to succeed with their next round of financing being at a more attractive valuation. And then lastly, we also have another sort of interesting thing. 
If we didn't have enough venture capital firms in the city, the truth is we actually want to attract more and we want to bring them from both coasts because as my friend Steve Case says, you know, there's a, the rise of the rest is going on. There's a tremendous amount of growth and excitement in the middle of the country. It's not limited to the coast. And so we want these organizations and these venture funds to come here to office at 1871, but we want it in a different way. It's easy to, uh, you know, have uh, the mayor call and say, you need to be here. It's easy to tell them that we think this is a good opportunity to be exposed to our member companies. Uh, and that's true, all of that is fine. It's probably not enough. They probably hear that from 47 different cities uh, on a regular basis. So we've added a little twist to that, which is that we've said to them, the real key to this is that you can now use those spaces as launch pads, as the opportunity for your portfolio companies to come and spend a month, not at Starbucks and in some, uh, you know, Motel 8 uh, you know, location, but at 1871 as part of the community, connected to the community with all of the attributes of that to explore the Chicago market, to explore how to open their business in Chicago and to reach these, this wonderful pool of customers. So these three changes are about a bigger tent, which is to say a broader span of uh, different kinds of companies focused on different areas, a longer term in terms of our alumni, and lastly, these, this idea of launch pads. And we think all of those are gonna be well received, that they're, they're gonna be important to the expansion, and so it's, uh, it's a big part of our plans. And in terms of the areas, as I said, we've already announced our Femtech incubator, which is focused on uh, women-led and women-owned businesses. Food tech we've announced in terms of uh, sustainable food. This is a fabulous partnership with uh, Jim Slama from the Good Food Festival. Also, uh, Whole Foods, the Cyril family, uh, tremendous opportunities. Real estate uh, we've announced. What's interesting is not so long ago, People weren't clear that digital and technology was changing every single business. Now it's abundantly clear. And so the need to be represented in these areas and to be helping startups make change in these areas is very significant. Internet of Things, of course, you know, and I'll show you in just a few minutes how scary that's going to be. Uh, ed tech, fintech, and startup engineering, all of those are of a piece with where we're, uh, where we're headed. So let me take a couple of minutes to just tell you about the process of innovation and what's so exciting about it. Turns out innovating is not hard. Change is not really hard. Uh, what's hard is to give up what worked for you in the past. And so what we think about when we talk to our companies is that this is all about seeing the exact same things that a zillion people have seen before, but seeing it differently or seeing a new and different solution. Uh, one of my favorites, and there's nothing that I love about air travel, but one of my favorite stories is the baggage handler who said, hey guys, how many engines does it really take for the plane to taxi on the ground, okay? And it turns out it doesn't take four engines, it only takes one engine. And in the first two quarters after they turned off the three engines that were burning fuel, they say $54 million, okay? So it's the little things that make for big changes. Speaking about you know, little things, uh, again, you know, one of the aspects of, of change is just overcoming the resistance. I mean, the change process happens pretty quickly. Um, I know all about overcoming resistance because I worked for the last decade in education. And all I can say is that it's easier to move a cemetery than it is to change a curriculum at a college. You know? so, <laughs> so no offense to any of our, you know, but in any event, so when I think about this, this idea that the size of an idea doesn't even relate to the scale and the power of those ideas, I think of McDonald's French fries. And, and the reason is uh, this little slit here, which you can see in the upper, uh, to your right, uh, that little slit is an innovation that's a very major significant thing that will save all of you, well, I don't know, it'll save you uh, your car upholstery, it'll save you a whole bunch of other things. What does it do? Well, you fold it over, and then you stick the ketchup package, which you've previously ripped apart, 
and gotten all over your fingers, all over your clothes, all over everything else, okay? And even when you got it open, you put it on a tray liner, who knows where that's been, or you put it on any open surface, this, you squeeze it, it squirts it out on that very clean, very part of the McDonald's container, and lo and behold, we have remarkable innovation around ketchup, so you never know. But uh, our goal is not to sit back and watch these things happen. Our goal is really to make these things happen, and that's what's so exciting. And as we look forward, we're not even talking about diagnostics anymore and about analytics. That's old school. That's too slow. We're talking about prediction, and we're talking about really looking over the horizon in exciting ways. Um, to give you an idea, today Google does a better job of estimating real estate trends than the people who work in the business, okay? They're 24% more accurate in terms of real estate forecasts based on what the world is doing in terms of looking than the National uh, Realtors Association. And that's just the beginning of this idea of predictability. Uh, you may have read about this. The dad called up and uh, you know, sort of bitched out uh, Target about sending his daughter all kinds of maternity ads and things. And they said, maybe you'd like to ask your daughter. And it turned out, of course, she was pregnant. Target knew that. Uh, maybe dad didn't know that. Uh, and the credit card companies now can tell us in the first three years of marriage what the likelihood is of getting a divorce. Now, that's pretty frightening. How do they do this, you ask, OK? So same city hotel charges, <laughs> flowers sent to an address other than your home, OK? Increased charges for self-improvement. Turns out, you know, when you're looking around, you're buffing up, right? And then singles bar charges. Now, why do they do this, OK? Not simply because they're pervs, OK? And they're definitely pervs. It's because the minute you decide to get divorced, of course, you know, all of the charges on the credit card belong to your ex-spouse, OK? So, so there's a legitimate business purpose, and they're snoopy. All right, anyway, so this is how the machines are going to begin to react. Uh, this is a great story about a guy who watched three Broadway shows on his TiVo. <laughs> And it concluded that he was gay, and so he had to immediately watch a couple of war movies and, <laughs> and about three football games, okay? Um, and so prediction is very exciting. The most powerful predictive group of all turns out to be kids who are living in their first apartments right after college, okay? They predicted the death of landlines, they predicted that they are no longer reading newspapers, cable, they're no longer buying TVs, they're certainly buying screens, but they don't think of them as TVs. And why do you think they're the most predictive, okay? Anybody who is a parent knows the answer to this. Now they have to pay for it, okay? So the true test, the rubber hitting the road, is what do they value enough to spend their money, of course, it's probably still your money, um, on, on these kinds of things. And you know the future is coming in a lot of really exciting ways. And this is just what we see every single day. And that's why it's so exciting to be in this kind of an environment. Uh, again, we're all going to be connected. Okay, We're all going to be linked. Okay, I have my uh, uh, Moto phone here. And I have my Moto 360 uh, device, uh, so it talks to my phone. It's just the beginning. Uh, and this idea that we're all tethered, uh, what do we need, when do we need it, where do we need it, without asking. Uh, you know, we call this smart reach. And what's so instructive for marketers these days is that the content is important, but nowhere near compared to the context in which your messages are delivered. If you hit me at the right time with the right information, you own me. And if you hit me at any other time in any other form or format, then it doesn't matter. I just don't care what you have to say. And so we're going to shop for our groceries at the L stop, at the bus stop, using our phones, OK? We're going to be able to be at a game and buy merchandise, OK, all virtually delivered. In the mall, products will jump out while we're walking down uh, in the midst of the mall. Uh, I said the Moto phone, but let me tell you about this idea of connectivity. These devices now, uh, the Moto 360, is a tool for supplying information right at our fingertips, and again, passively. And so what's significant about this, and I'll give you a little anecdote, 
uh, back at Tribeca Flashpoint, which seems like you know 4,000 years ago, um, we had to instruct everybody under 30 that if they were in a meeting and they were taking notes on their phone, they had to announce that. And the reason was, if they were feverishly scribbling on a legal pad, everybody said, wow, that guy is really diligent at listening. If they were on their device, even if they were taking notes, everybody said, that jerk is doing email or texting, okay? And so they had to disclose that. These devices are not really about telling time. And I, uh, you know, we were, I was just reminded two years ago, I said nobody under 25 wears a watch anyway. But uh, they're about this discreet ability to see who's talking to you or texting you by just sort of going like this, okay? And then, because you can't even reach for your phone anymore. I mean, it's so freaking rude. So anyway, uh, now, you may be in a bar and here's another powerful thing that your phone can do for you. This creates a fake Wikipedia page <laughs> that will let you win any bet in any bar anywhere, okay? You just say, all right, I need to be able to show them a Wikipedia page and, all right, so, even more powerful, and this crowd ages up pretty good, runp.com. What does it do? It tells you when to go pee at the movies, okay? You started at the beginning of the show. This guy and his mother and his grandmother have watched every movie, and it tells you what you're missing. Ah, it was a mushy love song. You know, love song, go pee, hurry back. You know, you didn't really miss anything, okay? This is the power of connectivity, and the Internet of Things is even more so, even more exciting. We'll press a button and a pizza will be delivered. And by the way, social media is changing the pizza delivery business. The big guys who are using social media very, very effectively, sales are up. The 70,000 little pizzeria getting killed, okay? Why? Because of the power of social media. This is a device that you throw in the washing machine. And when the washing machine, or the dryer rather, stops cycling, it calls your phone and says your load is done, okay? <laughs> These are leashes that permit you never to lose your keys, okay? This is a little piece of sort of sticky stuff that you put on anything you want and it will help you find it, okay? Uh, this goes in your luggage for $19.99. You can track your luggage anywhere in the world. This is my favorite, okay? Has anybody in the room not moved? Okay. So this is a little fake box that you add to the mover's load, and when they tell you that they're driving cross country but they're actually parked at a truck stop, again, watching porn, uh, <laughs> this sends you GPS signals all the way so you can track the progress of your load. Disney has uh, launched the Magic Band, very powerful, opens your door in the hotel, lets you pay for things, gives you premier access to the, uh, the lines in the park, uh, very interesting. Wearables are coming. All kinds of wearables. Very significant. A device that corrects our posture, okay? Um, a fork that if you're eating too fast, I don't know if you can see on here, it says Jay Doherty. Uh, no, uh, <clears throat> if you're eating too fast, it starts to vibrate. It says slow down, okay? Digest your food, all right? This uh, tracks what's going on in your thighs, okay, and reports it to your phone. These are sidewalks that generate kinetic energy when you walk over them in London. This is a hat that doesn't require earphones. It plays right through the bones in your head. This is a device that counts calories uh, on your desserts. This is the colon camera. The colon camera, you don't uh, have to have procedures in the same fashion. You swallow this little thing, it goes through your system, it takes pictures, talk about light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and this is a case for your iPhone that's also a stun gun, all right? A very handy thing in a bad neighborhood. These devices are getting so smart that this phone knows when you're looking at it and it turns off the screen when you're not. This is a camera system, and basically it waits till you smile to take the picture. This one asks you to signal with your hand when you're ready with a fist, and then it fires off the camera. So you can take all kinds of exciting selfies and, and never miss an opportunity. So what's driving all of this? What's the secret sauce? Work, okay, for sure. Passion and commitment, for sure. Perseverance, uh, a helping hand, astonishingly, uh, helping hand, uh, and we see it every single day with volunteers, with mentors, with companies, with sponsors, really exciting. And then making room for people, making room for all kinds of people. So what are we doing? We're trying to turn ideas into invoices. It's really a uh, onerous process. It's a very important process. And uh, you can help. 
Uh, we call this sort of Chicagoness, and none of this happens by itself. Change doesn't happen by itself. We make it happen in our efforts every single day, all of us together. And so that's what's going on. And here are a few things that I would suggest that you could do to help. First, you can come, and I won't embarrass anybody by asking who hasn't been at 1871, but shame on you. Uh, you can come see what is happening. And just to give you an idea, yesterday we had a team from an incubator in Bloomington. Uh, they'll be sending us uh, new members. John Medved came and brought five startups from Israel. We had the Arise 2.0 Accelerator Demo Day and Celebration. Uh, we had a webcast for Digital Sips, Wine and Technology. Uh, we signed a couple of new sponsors, of course. We had Kate Sullivan coming and interviewing our members. Uh, and tomorrow we have uh, a delegation going to Washington uh, to brief the Illinois Congressional District about new tech and technology and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have Cheryl Sandberg coming to uh, celebrate uh, with uh, us the sort of the second birthday uh, anniversary and also to talk to our uh, female and femtech entrepreneurs. And uh, all of that is of a piece of what goes on every single day. You can help us with mentors. You can help us with office hours. We're trying to curate these communications, and we're going to be evaluating the businesses, as you saw, and we need help doing that by people who have domain expertise. Uh, we're holding for corporations all kinds of innovation days where we assemble groups of our companies that are domain-specific to your business, and you get a chance to look over the horizon. Uh, you often have resources that you can share with us if you're bringing an important speaker to Chicago to speak to your group. Think about doing it at 1871. We have every year uh, a huge uh, charitable dinner, our Momentum Dinner Awards. This year it's October 9th at Block 37. Be a part of that. It's a really significant thing. October 9th, right. Perfect. Thank you. And last but not least, number one, customers are better than anything, including cash. So I'm done. Thank you very much. Pardon my rude interruption, but that's the anniversary of the Chicago fire. I'm sure you all knew that. Tribune knew that, of course. They have people there. Uh, Howard, you did take a little bit of a time, and so the first question will be real quick. No more questions. We got five. First one is from a lady named Judy. What time will we, will we be home? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Dan Miller, Chicago Innovation Awards, formerly from a lot of places. With 1871 and Mother and many other incubators uh, going full steam, what's that? Ignition? The ignition in the Chicago economy has been reached. What is, what is next? Okay. So we don't think there are other incubators. We just think there are people renting desks. Um, but having said that, what's next is to grow off of this foundation, which is a very exciting start. It has a lot of momentum. Uh, and we do think there's uh, critical mass. But one of the most important programs that's going on right now, and David Weinstein at 1871 is heading this process up, it's marrying these startups with our major corporations and really creating customers and pilots and opportunities to connect them more directly to uh, the customers. And that's a really, really important uh, part of the next generation of the process. OK. Uh, Suzanne Malik McKenna, Chicago Wilderness. You mentioned embedding an, eth an, an ethic of doing good with their work. Outcomes, you kind of said that. <laughs> I just read them, barely. <laughs> Examples of do-gooding that you encourage. Give us a do-gooding one. Well, so <clears throat> one of my favorite companies is a company called Zero Percent. Uh, they were part of our impact engine incubator. And what this guy did is uh, he was constantly being confronted with fresh food at the end of the day, whether it was in his college dorm or at uh, Potbellies or wherever it was. 
And those folks are very well intentioned. Uh, they would love to give that food rather than having it go to waste. And just to give you an idea about 40% of the food prepared in the United States is wasted. It's never consumed. About 17% of the food in restaurants is never consumed. Um, and so he tried to figure out what was the problem. And the problem was that on any given day, the charity down the street, the church, whatever, might be receptive to getting the food from the nearby restaurant. But it wasn't a continuing process, and it wasn't anything that uh, was standardized or streamlined. And so he built a mobile app that was nothing more than a telephone tree. And when a food owner has the opportunity and wants to give some food away, this thing starts calling charities until it matches the vendor of the food with the charity. And so nobody ends up dropping food at the church door that rots because nobody from the church is there that day and nobody ends up doing a lot of these things. So he's marrying the food with the people who need the food in the instant, all by digital and mobile technology. He's moved a million pounds of food so far uh, and it even issues a tax deduction documentation. So pretty cool. Okay. Two more. Uh, this is from Ashvin Ladd. Uh, with the mayor's goal of 55 million tourists by 2020, are there opportunities, well, obviously you know the answer, for 1871 to support business focused on tourism? If so, how? So for sure that, we just, um, at the uh, International Tourism Convention that was held for the first time in 16 years at McCormick Place, uh, we just enabled videos from uh, 16 different communities. They each had a video. What we did was we made their logo for their community active so that anyone who looked through their telephone, their phone, their mobile phone, could see and play the video. It was the hit of the show. And it then was something they all got to take home because it worked anywhere. It worked on any logo anywhere in the world. Um, it's all part of a technology that we're building and using with a bunch of our different companies. So in terms of tourism, in terms of getting the story, one of the other things that we're doing is we're putting together this uh, rack of four fake Divi bikes out at O'Hare. And you'll sit there for the, by the way, average time at the international terminal, four hours between flights, 40% of these folks never see the city. So the Divi bike idea is you'll sit on the bike, you'll get some exercise, you'll recharge your phone, and you'll watch a video that we intend to shoot from the handlebars of the Divi, taking you all over the city. So here's a route of the marathon. Here's driving from Wrigley to the Mart. Here's driving from the Mart to the Field Museum. All of those kinds of things from the perspective of the bike. We think it's a great way, and by the way, those videos then go worldwide, it's, and it brings Chicago to the world. Good. We have a couple of museum folks right here. From We've met with them. Oh, enough said. All right, last question. How are you? Doing great. Uh, start up New York. This is the last question because you know when you bring up New York, nothing's going to follow this. Here we go. This is from Lou Vasto. Lou, where are you? Raise your hand. All right, I saw Henry V last night, so cowards never, you know, I'll, I, won't, I won't say it. Start up New York is advertising their 10 year tax free startup zones to lure new business. You knew that. This is a state of New York Governor Cuomo plan. Do you think Illinois should do something like this? How do we compete? Um, you know, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, as I said about charity and about uh, community and contributions, I think the best way to compete is on the merits, not by additional grants, not by incentives that nobody will be able to really pay for, but by making it in the selfish interest of these businesses to be here to work with our companies and to grow with our economy. And that's how I would leave it. So thank you all very much.